Welcome to Chief Evangelist. I'm your host, Ethan Butte. I'm on a mission to explore and understand the role of the Chief Evangelist and the movement behind it. How should CEOs be thinking about it? How does it benefit the company? Which companies and markets need evangelism most? What does the work involve? What does success look like? And who's a good fit as a Chief Evangelist? That's what we're exploring at chiefevangelist.com and in conversations like this one. Today, we're learning from a thought leadership expert and perhaps a thought leadership evangelist. For nearly a decade, he served as the COO and thought leadership practice lead at Thought Leadership Leverage. And for nearly three years and more than 400 episodes, he's hosted Chief Evangelists, as well as Heads of Brand, Storytelling, Communication, and Thought Leadership on the Leveraging Thought Leadership podcast. Bill Sherman, welcome to Chief Evangelist. Happy to be here, Ethan. Yeah, I, I knew that there was a relationship in part because of uh, when we connected and, you know, I learned about your show, I listened to your show and I felt like I had found my people, a phrase that we've used back and forth a couple of times. I knew that there was a very strong relationship between the chief evangelist role uh, when performed well and thought leadership. And so I knew I wanted to bring this conversation to this podcast and you were, for a variety of reasons, the first and only person that I wanted to have this conversation with. Well, thank you. Yeah. So I, I guess to kind of get into that relationship, I'll ask you the question that I've been asking everyone to open, but we'll kind of proceed from there a little bit differently. And so I'll start with what is the most important job of, a, of an evangelist or a chief evangelist? So an evangelist in my mind, at least the way that I look at it from my perspective in thought leadership, an evangelist is someone who on behalf of the organization helps take ideas to scale, builds communities, sparks conversations, collaborates, and brings ideas back. It's a two-way street. Love it. And I especially like the community layer and sparking conversations in particular. I definitely think that is the um, you know, opening up the conversation, broadening the conversation, inviting people in, a uh, really strong element there. I guess to ask uh, a separate but very related question, what do you, how, what would you say is the most important job of a, let's say, head of thought leadership? So a head of thought leadership in an organization, and that can be anything from a Fortune 500 all the way to a pre-funding startup, is responsible for curating the ideas of the organization. They don't have to be the smartest person on the block. They don't have to be the dubbed genius, but instead they've got to spot the ideas that align with the organization's goals, meet the needs of their customer base or target audience, and then also spark energy from the people who have those ideas. So maybe you have someone, if you're in a software environment who's an engineer or is a product developer if they're going to get bored talking about that idea within 60 days that's a bad idea to try and scale to the world because they'll be like stop don't make me talk about that anymore love it um so i want to pick up on one thing you offered there and i'm probably getting ahead in the conversation in total but you just mentioned it Talk about, because this is a background conversation on this show already relative to evangelism. You know, you mentioned Fortune 500, but you also mentioned like even a pre-funded startup. Um, mm -hmm. Talk about thought leadership across that range. Like um, what is a sign that an organization should have someone appointed to this role of curating the best ideas? So I would argue that any organization, I'd even probably argue at the solopreneur level, that someone is effectively responsible for the organization's thought leadership. They may not be aware of it, okay? It may be a full-time role, or it may be a fraction of a role. It may be formally on the job description, or it may be informal. The biggest question is, if you go to your leadership team and you say, who's responsible for making sure that the best ideas flow within the organization, and then out and beyond to the people who need to hear them. If it turns into a game where everyone's pointing in a different direction, you've got a problem, right? That's the fundamental thing that you first have to address. And then you have to be able to set it up in a way so that 
people understand where does thought leadership fit as compared to marketing, content marketing, product marketing. There are many different flavors. And if you look at different organizations, depending on size and maturity, a thought leadership function can sit in research, it can sit in marketing, it can sit in comms, it can also be placed in sort of product development, right? There are different perspectives on where does it belong. It's really at the end of the day, even if you're a small startup, you still have to, if you're going to convince the world you have a better mousetrap, you've got to have a strategy of how you're going to tell the world you have a better mousetrap. I love it. And if you if you need to convince the world that there are mice and that they should be trapped, then you also need an evangelist. Right, exactly. Which, which leads me, I, by the way, thank you for walking that out. We're going to go deeper into it, um, into thought leadership functionally and some of the different ways you've seen it manifest and, and some recommendations perhaps uh, based on some made up hypotheticals I'm, I'll, I'll give you. But I, I want to speak to that intersection of evangelism and thought leadership because I, I already have a small vision of it just in the way you described um, described it so far, and that is, you know, curator of ideas, and there are various ways to carry those out to the market, and evangelism would certainly be part of it. But I know, uh, based on our conversations, that you have talked with and perhaps worked with people who have both an evangelist or a chief evangelist, as well as um, uh, someone in charge of a thought leadership function in a formal role. Like, how do you see those two working together? Again, it depends on the size of organization, and we can scale this conversation depending on that need. But the way that I think of it is this. Someone needs to be focused on the ideas, the flow of ideas within the organization, and also making sure that they're developed, they're supported, they're sound, they're reliable, trustworthy. The I's have been dotted, the T's have been crossed. And then the evangelist whether it's an evangelist on a category, whether it's on a product, et cetera, can take that message out to specific audiences and have conversations and also be that feedback loop so that if it's an idea isn't landing, then you, you can come back as an evangelist and say, we tried talking about this. They're not seeing why we think it's cool, right? And so this relationship between the head of thought leadership and the chief evangelist, in my mind, needs to be very symbiotic and very closely connected. It is difficult to do, in my mind, the evangelist role well without solid ideas underpinned. And it is also hard to take ideas to scale if you don't have someone out there who is the advocate internally and externally willing to talk about these ideas again and again with a level of passion and joy that really, in my mind, fits the role of evangelist. You've got to be a little bit of that energizer bunny and willing to talk anywhere, anytime to anyone. Yeah, I guess at the risk of asking the obvious, I'd love for you to go one step deeper to that. I love the way that you brought passion and joy and energy to it. I do think that is, you know, those are obviously very contagious um, and that's a critical piece of it. But at the, at the risk of asking the obvious, why a human being for that role? Why isn't it enough to create and distribute really good content? Why, why perhaps in your, in your view, um, do we need that human embodiment of this to carry it forth? Are you asking for chief evangelist or head of thought leadership? Uh, let's start with chief evangelist, I guess. Good follow up. Yeah. So we have the ability to mirror each other as humans. And I think that's a deeply human thing, first and foremost. Whether you want to talk about mirror neur neurons or likability, there's a lot of drivers for that. But one of the things that I look at, and it's based on research from customer satisfaction. And there's a lot of research that says your customers will never be more satisfied than your employees. The satisfaction of your employees is a ceiling for your customer satisfaction. I believe that to be true also when it comes to the world of ideas and communicating ideas. Your audience will never be more excited about your ideas than you are. Okay. And so having someone who isn't faking it, who hasn't been told you have to go out and talk about this, you, that is deeply human and deeply essential for authenticity, for connection, for 
inviting feedback, discussion, debate, intellectual sparring, um, active listening, all of those things are essential. And until AI gets a whole lot better, we can't just put a chatbot into that situation, nor can we fire over a white paper and say, hey, read this, you'll learn everything on you need by page 33. That's not how the world works. We are social creatures. Yeah, such a good response. I really, really appreciate it. And uh, so another podcast I host, the Customer Experience Podcast, I interviewed Elizabeth Dixon, who is a speaker and consultant, but she's also uh, head of service design and strategy at Chick-fil-A and her short take on what you offered there and you did this beautiful parallel you did there to uh, the world of ideas is your customer experience will never be better than your employee experience, right? It's the same spirit. I love it. Um, and it really good. And so let's spend a few minutes or several minutes getting into thought leadership. So I will confess my absolute ignorance until I started connecting with you, reading your content, our initial conversation. You were kind enough to host me on leveraging thought leadership. Prior to that immersion, um, because I, I go all in, like when I like when I was like, oh, this is a thing, like mm -hmm. I was all in. Um, and, and I felt like I'd found a community of people um that I had only picked up, you know, evangelists here and there. So that was a smaller group. Um, thought leadership broadened it out. I honestly didn't know that that was a proper function. The way you describe it, it's like, yeah, people need to do that work, but in my so I'm going to assume that someone else watching or listening right now is like I was before I met you, didn't know. So maybe start in the most basic, uh, most basic ideas, um, and perhaps address like, um, hey, Bill, what's what is thought leadership, and kind of what does it look like day to day, week to week, month to month, and of course there are a lot of variables. I know it depends, but like, what does the job of um, a head of thought leadership inside, let's just say a mid-sized company, um, just to make it up, let's say, you know, uh, 750 employees, um, maybe a couple hundred, few hundred million in revenue, something like that. Like, and, and in a, um, established, but still kind of growing space. So yeah. there you go. I gave you some print. So I, and you don't have to conform specifically to that, but no, I just wanted but to we can make out that a little work. bit. Like, like, but so that you're that. not talking fortune 500 and you're not talking startup. Yep. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like, yes. What is the, what is the role? So the role of head of thought leadership at this point may be a fractional role. It may be half that plus half something else. I've seen in cases where someone is sitting in the marketing function at organizations that size, they stumble into doing things that would be categorized as thought leadership, whether stumbling on their own or through the nudging of someone in leadership. And then there's a collective moment of, hey, what you're doing seems to be working. What is it, right? Do more of that, please. And what do you need to be successful? So if you look back historically, I would say prior to 2016, 2017, most of the thought leadership functions where it was a formally defined function sat in your large consulting houses, your McKinsey, Deloitte, Accenture, IBM, all of them because they were, you know, as consultants selling their knowledge, their expertise, and their gravitas had to demonstrate that in some way. Then um, the world started to shift and other organizations said, oh, we're in a knowledge economy at this point. Maybe we should be demonstrating that to our customers, our clients, our vendor ecosystem. Maybe we want to influence public policy in some way, but not through a lobbying arm. All of those things started to percolate up. So if we look at a day in the life, that person will be spending some time working vertically through the organization. They will also be working laterally. So one of the characteristics I look for in that individual is an inherent curiosity and the ability to connect and be a little bit of a social chameleon, the ability to be comfortable in many conversations, right? So they've got their an antenna out and they're rece receiving signal from many places. And they're also realizing 
A plus B, you two people need to talk to each other because you get parts of the same puzzle and they put that together. They are also some, I would think from a thought leadership perspective, many organizations move into thought leadership through what I would describe as tent pole thought leadership. It's the annual benchmarking survey or our annual white paper, or we're doing a round table or conference, a big event that gets a fair amount of funding, senior leadership visibility, and needs to make things work to a specific goal. Now, this person may be tasked with um, demand gen responsibility, although, and we can get into this, attribution is really hard in terms of how do you attribute and you're you're nodding for those who can't see but it's the same challenge of a chief evangelist as it is for thought leadership right but they will be creating pieces sometimes on an editorial calendar sometimes ad hoc depending on what's going on in the world they may be commissioning third party research they may be doing interviews with target audience members to make sure they understand what the audience is talking about. And then they're probably also working with internal creative team, the social media marketing team to make sure that just because you have a good idea and you say it once in one format doesn't mean the world is tuned in and listening. And so you have to figure out what modalities do I need to use? How do I get this idea out? And I would say those mid-market firms, which are a little bit further on the development cycle, have actually put in a structure in place and that says, okay, when we, we decide we want to take this idea out into a campaign, they know what that means. Others, I would say, since I, I said most organizations have only started making the function since 2016, and those were outside of consulting the early adopters. I would say in many cases, the head of thought leadership has less than two years in their current role in the organization. Now, they may have moved laterally from strategy or marketing or different places, or they may have been hired in, but in some ways, they're still trying to figure out, what am I doing? How do we define thought leadership here? Does everybody who needs to know what I'm doing understand that? And how do I recruit allies, support network, et cetera, so that I can create impact internally and externally. I love it. So many places I could go there. That was very thorough. You're obviously the person who I needed to have this conversation <laughs> with. And um, gosh, I guess I'll go, um, I guess I'll go to um, thought leadership leverage. Like you all are I mean, I know you've been there nearly a decade, but mm -hmm. you said that the practice itself internally um, is younger than that. Talk about kind of the timeline, like when this work was being done, let's say 15, because people have been doing this work somehow, yes. right? And I was um, in this field close to 20 years ago. Yeah. Okay. So walk that out. Tell me, um, tell me your story. Um, it's something we all often do here too, is like the chief evangelist origin story, but how did you get turned on to thought leadership? How did you make your way into it? And then uh, perhaps, and I'll remind you of this, if, if you don't rope it all in together at once, talk about how you're serving people at leveraging thought leadership. How are you supporting this function and, you know, the range of organizations that you're doing it with? But um, let's start with your story. Like what, like, how did you build your career? When did you get turned on to this idea? When did the name thought leadership start to mean something to you? And when did you really embrace it and turn your direction to learning more about it, practicing it and helping other people with it? So if you ask the 20 year old version of myself, what I thought I would be when I grew up, and this is me coming out of college, going into grad school. I envisioned that I would be a professor at a four-year university teaching either English Lit or theater. I had done a double major in both, did a master's in drama, worked towards a PhD in English Lit. And then I was studying for comprehensive exams, and I saw that there were a thousand, tenure, a thousand applicants per tenure track position in English Lit. I looked at that and I said, that's no way to start a career. And I said, what else can I do? So basically left academia immediately, you know, newspaper of the Chronicle of Higher Education rolled under my arm going, I got to be out of here, right? I landed in the world of corporate training, 
instructional design. And really where I settled was organizational development, getting the right people to do the right thing at the right time for the right reason and making sure that they were rewarded. For me, that was deeply resonant and deeply fulfilling work, working mostly with mid caps and fortune 500s. Okay. And during that consulting era for me, I wound up having a situation where I had a C-level tech client in Silicon Valley who had written a business book, got it on the cover of Fast Company magazine, and all of a sudden inbound started coming in. And he scratched his head a little bit and said, you know, I wrote a business book because I thought that's what C-level execs did. I didn't expect the inbound the same way. And so he and I had a conversation. He said, Bill, you know how to take ideas to scale within an organization. Can you help me? And that's how I stumbled into the world of thought leadership. Um, so I was day job in the early and mid 2000s running an OD consultancy and having a team underneath me. And then every now and then I would get this call from an executive who'd written a book and said, my friend said I should contact you, right? And so there was in the early 2000s sort of this whisper network of thought leadership that was going on. And these are the days when we went to Barnes and Noble and we browsed bookstores. Loved and it. Yeah, exactly. I know I'm describing a time period that in many ways no longer exists, but for me, I continued working organization development and on the side would help people on figuring out how to take ideas to scale. And it was in 2013 that my business partner, Peter Winnick, um, he and I were talking and we'd worked together on projects and we said, you know, it would be fun to do a thought leadership project together. And he said, yeah, let's do something. He said, when something comes up, I'll let you know. And I'm like, yeah, I'll moonlight. Six weeks later, we were merging our two companies and we haven't looked back since. And so my world of thought leadership was accidental. The way that I describe it to people who are probably under 35 now is no one went to school for this, right? And the playbooks aren't written. I have seen in the last couple of years, a few interns in thought leadership, undergrad and hmm. master's students in marketing. And so I've sort of chuckled and smiled and reached out on LinkedIn. It's like, tell me about your program. Who's sponsoring an internship and what are you doing? Yeah. How, um, okay. What were you doing for those leaders back in the day and how are you serving companies today? Like what does supporting the function, uh, or are you helping get the function off the ground in the first place? Like what were you doing back then? And how, what is it, how much of that carries over to still being necessary so, and useful today? So that's a really good question. And I would say, Given my background in OD plus then my colleague Peter's background, both of us gravitate towards strategy. And so in many ways, thought leadership leverage is first and foremost a strategy house. Similar to like if you thought of an HR function, you would still have external HR consultants, right? We are thought leadership consultants, right? And strangely, we have the gray hair that very few people have in this field. There are some of us, but it's not a large population. And so what we wind up doing, whether with individuals or organizations, is making sure that thought leadership is strategic, planned, purposeful, and in some cases, then also getting down to the tactical level and helping with campaigns and deployment. But really, for me, what I look at is how do you align either an individual's goals, okay? If you're the thought leader, if you've got the insights and the ahas, first off, it's got to align to your goals. Otherwise, you're going to get bored. You're going to hate doing it no matter what else the situation is. Second, whether it's your organization, you're a senior leader in the organization, or you're somewhere as an expert within the, an organization, you're being asked to align to the goals of the organization. That thought leadership has to be grounded in reality and business reality. Otherwise, 
budgets don't get approved, resources don't happen, time doesn't get made. Finally, you've got to figure out how to be relevant to first, who is your target audience? What's on their mind? If you're talking about something that's not on their mind currently, but they need to think about, maybe you have an answer to a problem that's going to appear next year or the year after that, you've got to find a way to cut through the noise and say, look, I know you're busy, but here's what I think you should be doing now so you don't have a fire drill in 18 months, right? And that's a challenge, right? So what we wind up doing is a lot of strategy work, work on building and identifying target audiences and avatars working on messaging for the idea. So what is the idea's platform? And the way that I describe a platform is people have personal brands, right? We learned that in the 90s, Tom Peters and, and, and his work, that how you show up, whether you're responsible, reliable, funny, you know, good collaborator, that's why people say gotta have you. Then the organization has a brand, which is all about brand promises, brand equity. How do people perceive the organization? Funny thing is ideas have, have a brand too. And I call it a platform, but an idea needs to be able to explain to others what it's about, why it's important and why it's relevant. And if you have an idea, if you, and you're trying to take it to scale, and you don't have a brand for the idea, then one of two things happens. Either it leans on the brand of an individual who came up with that idea, or it leans on the brand of the organization. In both cases, it's sort of like a toddler who wanders off for a little bit, then comes running back and latches onto your knee and it stays there, right? And you're like, no, 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 go out and play, right? That's what we need to do is create the brand for the ideas so that those ideas reach scale really well described there, especially the toddler on the leg. I mean, I can, I can see it. Like, can you see this? Like, like go idea, be powerful. Um, right, create you know. impact. Yeah. And it's just right there, you know, yeah. at your knee. Yeah. Talk about, I've got a couple directions I want to go, but I'll start, I guess you kind of spurred me in this thought, which I wasn't going to formulate this as a question I, I hadn't planned to anyway, but thought leadership. Um just break it down as a name for the idea of thought leadership. Like, like obviously ideas is kind of the thought piece of it. And of course, um, thoughts, feelings, impressions, you know, it's related to brand at some level or it's a brand for the ideas. And then talk about the leadership piece. Like who are we leading? Like just talk about the term itself and um, what it means to you, why you think it fits this thing. And, and, Certainly, of course, like chief evangelist, I'm sure a lot of people have um, had some pushback on that as a title. Mm -hmm. So take it as a term, then maybe as a title. So if you take the term thought leadership, it has a companion term, thought leader, right? And if you look at the origins of the term thought leader, it actually applies to some of the essayists and thinkers of the 19th century in American literature. Okay. And the, those are some of the earliest people identified by others as thought leaders in their essays, right? And rather than someone stepping up onto a stage and saying, hello, I'm your thought leader today, right? That's not where it came from. A lot of people, I think, have a reflex reaction that's sort of like the, um, knee-jerk reaction when they think someone's being full of themselves, pretentious, um, or, or patting themselves on the back, right? And so many, many in the field avoid the term calling themselves a thought leader. They say, I practice thought leadership because in that mindset, it's like yoga or meditation. It is the journey rather than I got a gold star or I got a diploma, therefore I am a thought leader right? So, but what is thought leadership? What I come back to is as a function, it's taking ideas to scale. And there are many ways to help that happen. I think many of us get into business. Many of us go even into the world of nonprofits to create impact. And if we're not thinking about that, set that aside, 
But if you want to create impact, whether for your customers or for your organization or yourself, you have to become a student of the question, how do I create impact? And throughout history, a lot of impact has been created through ideas, ideas that become successful, that spread, that other people adopt. I mean, we have a general business lexicon. We use the term thought leadership. We use the term trusted advisor. And if you trace the language trusted advisor back, that's uh, David Maester, Charlie Green, and Galford that coined the term in the late 90s. Now, there are people who I've heard use that term who've never read the book, never knew, but they under something that was invisible has been made visible and been defined. And so that process of peering around the corner into the future, finding the good ideas, bringing them back and saying, here's what you can do today, a small practical step. That's the process of thought leadership. It manifests differently, whether you're in a big organization or a small organization. But if you don't have that spark, and if you don't have that passion, it I think most people will fall asleep if you say, hey, I've got a big idea. Let me tell you all about it. No, no. They want to know either how your idea relates to them or they want you to hear their problems, right? Yeah, so much good stuff in there. I really appreciate the the journey slash process aspect of it, the way you described it. I also like the way you took... Uh, probably the most common complaint off the table. And, and the way I describe it is if someone calls themselves classy, they probably mm -hmm. are not. Yep. But when your aunt tells you that that person is classy, you're like, oh, there's probably a classy person that means something, but it's not something you assign yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I appreciate that as a practice too, like this practice process journey um, element to it. I'm going to lay a few um, kind of ideas and functions out on the table and do whatever you want with them in terms of their relationship or association with one another. Um, evangelism, thought leadership, content creation, community building, perhaps category design. These all have relationships, traditional sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. um, do whatever you want with that. I mean, these are these all have some relationship to one another. Um, so you can just grab two of those and make them talk to each other or do whatever you want with them. But like, how do you think about those different pieces? And um, yeah, do whatever you want with that. So the first thing that comes to mind from the perspective of thought leadership, and I'll describe it as the last mile problem. Okay. We, in the world of logistics, hear about the last mile problem of how do you get something from the local drop-off point to the customer's address? In this case, thought leadership has a similar problem. How do you get an idea into the mind space of the person that you're trying to reach? Now, thought leadership on its own is going to struggle with the last mile problem. But if you've got a sales team, you've got a marketing team, they have tools and equipment that are designed to help solve that last mile problem. Now, on the sales side, that means spending a lot of time working with your sales team to make sure that they understand the big ideas because sales isn't going to talk about things they don't understand or they don't feel as connected to what they're measured on and how they're rated and they're supposed to perform, right? So you have to align your messages with their needs before you can even reach your target audience if you're going through sales. Similarly, through marketing. Content marketing has a, a, a close relationship to thought leadership. And I've seen some awful definitions between the two where I think my favorite is thought leadership is your smartest content marketing. I'm like, great, what am I supposed to do with that? Does someone come down and get put a big letter A on this one and go, yeah, that's Just three gold put it stars. On a bumper sticker and drive around. Yeah, with it. exactly. Yeah. yeah. How do I tell what is my best? I need to engage in the world of ideas and conversations with people who are also passionate about these topics. And often thought leadership. You can't do, do a Google keyword search, figure out what search terms people are searching on, 
Because thought leadership is talking about things that either are in the future, which sounds a little bit like category creation, right? Or people don't know they even have a problem that can be solved. And so you can't treat thought leadership and the deployment methods the same as content marketing, but you have a similar need as category creation. How do I get someone to look at a situation, a problem or a need in a different way to realize the conventional wisdom can be overturned, should be overturned, will be overturned from a Gartner sort of hype cycle way, right? Yeah, a lot there. Um, I also want to call back to your nod to Tom Peters and Charlie Green on you know, the foundations of ideas that get... Oh, oh get Tom Peters had the greatest gig when he was at McKinsey. So he was given a project to try and come up with a framework around how systems thinking worked in organizations. And he was basically told he had no budget, but he had unlimited travel and he could use the access of the firm to go speak with anyone. And so literally you have the corporate jet, you can stay anywhere, you can interview anyone calling on behalf of McKinsey. And that's how In Search of Excellence gets written. And that's one of the amazing books of thought leadership that shaped an entire generation of B-School, you know, curricula. So good. I And, and also, you know, well done on tying category creation in there. Um, I want to go to you again, personally. I want to talk about the channel of podcasting and your own community building efforts um, and what the motivations were and how that's going for you. So talk, talk first, I guess, about podcasting and what role that plays for you as someone who is learning, practicing, teaching. It's one of the things I love about podcasting is that it just helps me do everything better and it's fun to do. But um, I'd love to hear it from your perspective and maybe a couple key takeaways um, regarding evangelism or thought leadership that maybe emerged as themes that um, came through the podcast. So one of the things that I've learned through the podcasting process is you get the opportunity to identify the questions and then seek out the experts that you want to talk to, right? And so there is a bit of a luxury in some ways where you go, okay, who do I, who's the best person to talk to on this subject? Let me go talk to them. And for someone who has a mindset of a continuous learner, I think podcasting is one of the most delightful roles that you can actually do because unlike on a sales call or many other forms of outreach, people are a little bit flattered when you say, hey, I'd like to interview you or I want to talk about what you wrote. That's a good thing. It also allows you to have conversations with the people that you're trying to reach. You turn them from an abstract sort of target avatar, document, persona, into a person that you know and that you've heard and you've had conversations with them. And that relationship building process, and one of the things that you and I both do, and I think is essential, is before you ever record with someone, you have to do a pre-podcast conversation. Because if you go in cold to that conversation, you don't know each other, it stands out so clear and so obvious in listening. And the questions are so stilted or scripted that it's uninteresting. What I strive to do and what I tell my guests is, imagine we're sitting down having coffee at a coffee shop. Someone walks by, there's an empty chair. They pull up a chair and listen. And that's community building through, well, fireside chat, or if we go back to early 20th century, radio as a modality. And radio still exists. And I, I think in some ways, this is a 21st century version of many early radio shows, right? Except the technology bar makes it accessible that we don't have to have a giant studio and a tower to broadcast, right? Yeah, and we can get very, very specific about what we're talking about and who we're talking to and still find an audience. Right, right. And our reach is global. And even if we said, you know, here's a topic that maybe 5,000 people in the world will care about, 
you can still reach that 5,000, whereas no one in your city other than you might tune in, right? And so that's a delight. And now on the community building side, as a offshoot of that, because I interview people who are practicing thought leadership in large organizations or are heads of thought leadership in their organization, I realized, and this was towards the end of 2022, there wasn't a coherent community for people to come together. And this is something I heard more than once as I would be doing the pre-podcast interviews. Someone would, I would ask them, so tell me about your team. And it's like, oh, I'm a team of one and I'm not sure anybody here still gets what I'm doing. My leadership has faith in me, but a lot of people are scratching their heads. And I realized that's a lonely position to be in. And so one of the things that I said I can do is, okay, let me, and this was still, you know, we're floating back and forth through pandemic waves and that sort of thing in 2022. I said, I will block out an hour a month where I will create a roundtable community. I will invite practitioners uh, of thought leadership from organizations and show when you can. And we'll have a uh, Chatham House Rules conversation. We will talk about the practice of thought leadership in an ongoing way. You can meet people. And one of the delights of the roundtable that has grown over the last year is I know not only have practitioners met each other, but they've also then found opportunities to collaborate across organizations. And when ideas spread, and it's like, Going back to the old Reese's peanut butter commercials, someone realizes they've got chocolate, someone realizes they've got peanut butter, you put them together, hey, this is even cooler than before, right? I've seen those moments happen, and that's why I'm such a believer in community building. Yeah, I started a, an evangelist group as, you know, I, you know, ran into another, yet another, yet another, yet another, uh, and I did a few times, I, I need to do what you did, which is just put them on the calendar. You mm -hmm. know, just put them on um, because I am my own uh, hang up there. I need to get that back going again. Uh, question to tie those two a little bit um, between your podcast guests, folks in the community. How much do you think the thought leadership community has embraced podcasting or is podcasting like alongside and that's just another um, channel or avenue to gather and curate ideas from and like Talk about podcasting relative to thought leadership, because most of the evangelists I know are guesting and most of them are hosting uh, podcasts. I was just wondering what the, what the parallel is in thought leadership. So on thought leadership, um, the heads of thought leadership may be curating or setting up the platform for podcasting, but they may not be the host of the podcast. From a thought leadership perspective, one of the things that I love about podcasting is Everybody sort of who listens to podcasts identifies what shows they listen to, right? And it's a great way to reach micro niche targeted audiences who are interested in what you talk about, right? And it doesn't require you to get on planes, doesn't require you to talk to some association or group and bounce around the country. You can reach out to a host of a podcast that fits who the people you're trying to reach and say, hey, I'd love to be a guest. And I know you're constantly looking for guests. Does this fit? Right? That is a very effective way of narrow casting thought leadership to small target audiences. And one of the things about thought leadership is if we think about a continuum, right? On one side of that continuum, you've got Super Bowl ads and advertisements in airports, you know, the big banners and posters and everything like that. Huge media spends to buy out an airport or a Super Bowl ad. But on the other side, you've got thought leadership or a message which is tailored for one individual. Imagine at the extreme, a white paper written for just one person. But you know that if you can influence that person's thinking, it, it's going to be paying off in spades, right? In the middle, you have narrow casting. Narrow casting is targeted outreach to an audience that has been aggregated by others or gathered by you. And unless you've spent a lot of time aggregating your own audience, 
then the easiest way to get started is to reach out through people who have been. And it's an effective way. Yeah, really good advice. I one at the at the risk of uh taking too much of your time. I would love to hear your thoughts on we'll kind of call this maybe the last topic zone before my fun question for you. Oh, these have all been fun. I agree. They're all fun <laughs> for me too. I guess playful. Uh yeah. as even it's even got an aspect of play to it. In any case, um talk about like I, I just think you'll have an interesting perspective on this. You know, the way to get through to someone is not exclusively intellectual. So as we're talking about expressing these ideas, sharing these ideas, ideas catching and spreading, influencing someone's thought, as you talked about in point casting to one person, um, talk about the role of ideas, argument, ideas is the broad term, um, arguments, data points. Uh, logical constructions versus emotional appeal, tapping into kind of human response to things in order to like, just talk about the balance of those two things and um, how you've been asked about it or how you've advised around it or even how you've executed it yourself throughout your career. So I'll take it on a couple different layers. Awesome. Um, years ago, when I was in grad school, I was teaching first year college composition to undergraduates in the English Lit Department, which meant it's how to not plagiarize your research paper and how to think your way through an argument and not commit log logical fallacies, right? How do you make a well-structured argument? And that process carries through. You've got to have sound underpinnings for whatever argument you're making. If you have data, that's credible, but you need to make sure that data is reliable, sound, and been tested. It's sort of like, you know, the scientific method. You can put out a research paper that claims anything, but if your data gets questioned, people don't believe the results. You can also have stories. You can have case studies. You can appeal through logic. You can appeal through emotions, through ethics. And I think I just quoted Aristotle there with the logos, pathos, and ethos. I mean, this has been going on for a long time, but realistically, you have to remember that your audience is human. And just like we all have fatigue from social media and we become really good at figuring out, is this relevant to me in two seconds spot as we figure out if this is relevant to me in two seconds as I'm scrolling through social media, you have to find a way to engage at the top. And whether that's through humor, whether that's through an ethical appeal, whether that's through our shared humanity, how do you cut through the noise? How do you be present and real? And not everybody gets excited about a white paper. You know, I know some people who Excel spreadsheets, and that's their jam, and they love it, and they love an argument constructed in a spreadsheet. Other people, that's the kiss of death. And so you have to understand your audience, not only as a group, but also as individuals. And I think back, now this is on the thought leadership practitioner side, but it also applies to consumers of thought leadership, those who engage in it. So I had a client once who was the CEO of a financial services firm, and he said, look, I have both ADHD and dyslexia. If you tell me I have to write a book, just get up and get out of here because this is not going to happen. I will hate you. If you tell me I can make a documentary, now we're talking. And so he was excited about documentary film, and that's where his passion and his storytelling came to be. And he brought his ideas through life by telling stories through a visual medium. Okay, totally doable. You have to figure out when you're creating content for your audience as thought leadership, you can't stay in your comfort zone. You might be a writer. You might be a filmmaker. You might be the analyst who loves spreadsheets whatever. But if that's not your audience's preferred modality of receiving ideas, those ideas fall flat. 
And so you have to stretch your comfort zone. Cycling back to why did I get into podcasting? Because it was something I hadn't done before. Really good. I'm so glad I asked. And I'm so glad uh, you were kind enough to spend this time with me before I let you go, Bill. First, thank you. Second, what is something uh, that you have found yourself or perhaps even been accused of evangelizing in your own personal life? So when it comes to passions, I think mine um, on the personal side in the last eight years has been running and it has become a large part of my life, both by health necessity, but also then transformation. And so I have to balance my desire to talk about that, share with that and realize oh, not everybody wants to talk about that to the level that I do because I'll consume all sorts of information. I'll go online. I'll be watching videos. I find it fascinating. I want to learn, right? And I guess we all have a level of geekdom, if you will, in certain areas where whether that's classic cocktails or cigars or movies or theater, film, whatever, we find the thing that we get excited about and that's our passion. For me, that's become running. Awesome. I, and, and that's something I share with you, although your passion is deeper than mine, I think. I just like to go out and run. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I should probably approach it uh, more thoughtfully. Uh, last time we talked about running, I was sharing an injury of mine, uh, which is uh, in large part the result of ignorance. Um, so I should probably step more in your direction with regard to this shared passion. Um, Bill, you are awesome. For folks who have made it to this point in the podcast, they may want to learn more about you or connect with you or some of the work that you're doing. Where would you send people? I would send people to LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. If you look Bill Sherman and Thought Leadership Leverage, you will find me. Um, also the podcast, Leveraging Thought Leadership, if you want to hear from other practitioners in the space who are doing either evangelism work or thought leadership for organizations. Super. Uh, for folks listening, I recommend both. Bill is a very consistent sharer of ideas on LinkedIn. He is a great connection to have. And the podcast is a joy. If you like this one, you will also learn from and meet some good people on that podcast as well. Bill, thank you again so much for your time. And I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you for creating this conversation, Ethan. I enjoyed it. That wraps up this episode of Chief Evangelist. Thank you for joining us. And thanks to Ringmaster Conversational Marketing for helping bring these episodes to you. With any thoughts or questions about the Chief Evangelist role, message me on LinkedIn. I'm Ethan Butte, E-T-H-A-N-B-E-U-T-E. -E -E. For show notes and more of these conversations, visit chiefevangelist.com.